I was born into an, you know, an environment that was, you know, unexplainable and very unhealthy and toxic. Um, my biological father was the leader of a satanic cult and wow. brainwashed my mother into, you know, thinking that this was, you know, what they, this is the life they lived. And so she couldn't kind of get out of that state of mind. And during that period, uh, my father uh, molested my sister and I. Some of the earliest memories of abuse that I have, a lot of them I blocked out of my memory because they were so horrific. My mom would come home from the grocery store and find me hiding in the closet after the sexual abuse had occurred. My mom wasn't aware of the abuse um, that was transpiring against me. And a lot of times there's brainwashing involved, which is very, and when I talk about a pattern, what I realized is that brainwashing can happen in any abusive situation. Good morning, everyone. This is Cynthia Motters, and this is the Army Pink podcast. And for those of you who don't know about Army Pink, it's a brand that is shining a light on abuse. And we started with our peace pendants, um, which are available for purchase and you can also click and subscribe to our youtube site and we donate a dollar for every peace pendant sold uh, to peace over violence in hopes of getting someone out of abuse via transportation and we do these podcasts where we invite various speakers to come and tell their stories in hopes that our audience can gain some tools can gain some insight or just have some support for maybe what they're going through. Um, so with that, we're gonna get started and kind of jump in here. We have today, Serena Mastin, who is the CEO of Pulse Marketing. Hi, Serena. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you for joining. This is so great. And uh, Serena has a very different point of view on things. And, and I really love it because she's all about kind of getting out there and telling your story. And she is an author of a book called Exposed. You can't heal when you hide. And I just, I think that just hits the nail on the head. That is a brilliant <laughs> title. Um, so look for her book. Um, where's your book being sold? Where can they find it? So I'm in the publishing stages right now. So it'll be available in just a few weeks, but they can download the first chapter for free on my website at serenamastin.com. Oh, fantastic. And when will the book be available in its full form? Uh, it should be available in about three weeks and okay. they could purchase it on uh, my website okay. or they'll be able to purchase it through Amazon um, and most of the online book retailers. All right, fantastic. And I think, um, you know, just again, by the title, anybody going through a, a, abuse, finding that that strength to to tell and we're going to talk about the healing and how that helped you but um there was another quote uh you said it said when we use our own voice to tell our stories we unleash our inner strength and yeah. i think that's so telling but it's so hard for people to take that first step right and be that courageous we i think when you hear a lot of stories at least the ones i've heard they are embarrassed they are scared um maybe they don't want to get someone in trouble uh that because it's somebody close to them that you know is abusing them there's so many factors so i think well you know, and you're protecting protecting so a lot of, yes so a lot of times you protect the abuser because for many, many reasons, but part of it is because you almost feel there's a sense of responsibility mm -hmm. uh, because of the shame that you're carrying. You feel like you need to protect them. It's also, um, you know, I'm not a counselor, but I've been through multiple times types of abuse. And the abuser is typically someone that um, creates more guilt and shame because they come back and they apologize or they try and bring you back in. So you almost have these mixed feelings about the abuser, depending upon the situation, not recognizing how to treat the circumstance. Right. And I think in, in talking to some people, they actually felt at times or early on that they they were causing it. 
Oh and yeah. It's their fault. Or they deserved it. Or they deserved it. Yeah. Yes. So can you, do you feel comfortable telling us kind of what precipitated this whole journey and where it started? Yeah. So, and let me kind of go back into the beginning of my journey. Um, I was, um, I was born into an, you know, an environment that was, you know, unexplainable and very unhealthy and toxic. Um, my biological father was the leader of a satanic cult and wow. brainwashed my mother into, you know, thinking that this was, you know, what they, this is the life they lived. And so she couldn't kind of get out of that state of mind. And during that period, uh, my father uh, molested my sister and I. Oh, yeah. um, he had tape recorders around the house. Um, you know, members of the cult would follow us if we left the house. Uh, all the phone conversations were recorded. And so we were trapped in this environment from a very young age. And then by the time I was five, we were able to get out of that environment. But then I was put into witness protection and the foster system. Which then was, was led to more. Was it a compound or was it just a community of these worshipers? It was just a community of the cult. And so um, some of the earliest memories of abuse that I have, a lot of them I blocked out of my memory because they were so horrific. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a lot of times when we're little, what we do. Right. But one thing I remember specifically, and this is kind of what I realized was a pattern, mm -hmm. is my mom would come home from the grocery store and find me hiding in the closet after the sexual abuse had occurred. My mom wasn't aware of the abuse um, that was transpiring against me and and thought that she was enduring most, most of the abuse. Was and she getting physically abused too? Yes. Oh. Yes. So physically and sexually, she was being abused in many um, horrific ways. Uh, you know, in the satanic culture for this particular um, cult, there was bestiality. There was all, you know, kinds of things that you really would. It's a it's an explicit journey, as you could imagine. I mean, it's just hard to, um, you know, satanic is so far removed from us, right? I mean, we, we hear a lot about abuse and I, it's, it's huge, but you never hear that layer because it's, it's, I guess it's so hidden, right? Yes. And, and a lot of times there's brainwashing involved, which is very, and when I talk about a pattern, what I realized is that brainwashing can happen in any abusive situation. Um, not just the cult, it just, my story just happened to start that way. Right. But then in addition to that, my response was to hide. And mm -hmm. so what I learned through my behavior and patterns throughout my entire life is that any type of abuse, whether it's verbal, physical, sexual, any of those things, my first response is to freeze and to hide. Yeah. yeah. And so it's a safety, isn't it? It's like you're yeah. protecting yourself. And so that's why I relate to so many like different levels of abuse is not only because of the starting of my story or the yeah. beginning of my story, but also because when you're in the foster system, when you are, you know, by the time I was 16, I was living on the streets Wow. and, um, you know, I was, you know, struggling with addiction. Yeah. No, so your, your mom didn't have any clue that you were being sexual abuse sexually abused i think that under and my mom is my best friend now so okay. know that we've come so far yeah yes. um know that whether she she wasn't fully aware of what was happening because there were so many things happening to her right okay and, and she so, was probably being brainwashed too right exactly yeah yeah so it's it's almost like when you're experiencing something a lot of times you're trying to protect everyone around you but you're unaware of what is actually going on because there's a there's a sense of denial right. and there's also a sense of protecting that you think that you're doing what you can but in the same sense it's you don't realize that it could be hurting them more because you're yeah. staying right now the cult uh people were were i've got to believe that they were also doing it to their kids and doing it to other people that like this was all accepted behavior 
So the, the night before we got out, um, and I remember just being a, a little girl, imagine a little five-year-old girl. And I walked into the, we lived in a, a single wide mobile home. Mm-hmm. And I remember going into the kitchen and seeing my father hovering over a cauldron that wow. was on the stove. Oh. You know, I don't know at the time what this is. I don't understand it. But what I come to find out later is that he was preparing a spell or or something of that sort for a ritual where he was going to sacrifice my sister and I to the cult. Wow. Um, that is like right out of a book. <laughs> like, I, I know. don't even fathom that. I know. And, and I didn't understand what that meant until I did a little bit more research. And what that typically means is that it's a sexual sacrifice. And you, um, I mean, the cult members would be able to basically, you know, abuse you any way they want, um, you know, until, you know, either death or until they're, they're finished. And so we got out that morning before that happened. And, and that's kind of where the whirlwind of, of even more chaos began. So was there a point, though, that your mom did realize, like, okay, this is imminent danger. Um, You know, I have to get my daughters out of here. And so she planned this, like, escape. Yes. And so the only way that she was able to plan her escape was one of the cult members that actually had built a relationship with her had devised the plan to get her out when he was under her watch. Oh, so that was the that was the way that we were able to get out. But he's going to be training the cult, right? Of course. Yeah. But, you know, I think that there was um, not knowing that much because I was so young. I could imagine that there was a sense of of like trying to to do the right thing, but also not really understanding if that's your religion um, and I don't understand the religion, even though I, I was born into that world. Yeah. It's just a completely different uh, mindset. It actually terrifies me because of some of the things that I saw when I was little that I, I even have trouble watching uh, movies that have similarities in right. that because it brings back that that fear. Yeah, that fight or flight kind of, oh, what am I, you know, yeah. Yeah. And so by the time we got out and we were, my sister and I were put into foster care, my mom now had to earn her rights back as a parent because she exposed us to a dangerous, you know, environment. Right. Um, and through that, there was even more abuse through some of the scenarios and some of the people that I stayed with, including other family members. And so I remember, um, I believe I was, and I can't remember off the top of my head, I I was either eight or nine years old. And I had decided to, and I was staying with an aunt and an uncle at this time. And and this was on my mother's side. So completely separate from my father's side. And I remember that my aunt um, was always highly irritated by me. You can imagine that as a child, I had a lot of emotional issues. I had uh, dissociated from reality. I, you know, I was hyperactive, you know, hyperactive. I was rebellious. I was taken away from my mom. So my, my reactions and my behavior were out of control at that time. And so I could imagine why she was so stern. However, this particular experience was, uh, a type of abuse that was probably one of the most damaging as a, a child, I was getting ready to take a shower. I mm-hmm. put the shower on. I'm nine years old. I, um, I'm taking my shirt off and it gets stuck on the, the top of my head. <laughs> you know, when you're a little, when you get your shirt on. Oh yeah. You can't get it off. You're struggling. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And I decide to do mouthwash commercials in the mirror oh. while the shower's running. Uh-huh. And um, I guess I had, dr- I had, basically drank the entire bottle of mouthwash <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. creating these commercials. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, um, my aunt walks in and is infuriated that I hadn't gotten in the shower yet. 
Um, I put the mouthwash bottle behind my back, forgetting that there's a giant mirror right oh, next to me. Yeah. And, um, you know, she was just enraged with my my choice at that moment. And she pulled me out of the bathroom and she made me stand in front of the bay window with my panties around my ankles, my shirt stuck on my head and oh. the bay window faced the busy street. Oh and it just happened to be that day that my cousin was a teenager and all of his friends were moving things in and out of the house. And I had to stand there with my panties around my ankle and my shirt on my head. Cool. Yes. So there's those types of abuse that I experienced as a young child. Was that your dad's sister or your mom's sister? That was my mom's brother's wife. Okay. Your mom's so my brother. aunt on my mom's side. Yeah. And my uncle was in the hospital, um, you know, and he was dying of cancer at the time. And so I understand that her mind was not clear. Right. But she still put me in that situation, which scarred me for many years because I felt so exposed and humiliated. Um, I felt the shame. I mean, it it impacted my my whole being. Yeah, your and, whole psyche, your whole confidence, your whole it's so humiliating, right? Yeah. And remember, I'd already been sexually abused. So now yeah. it's a different type of abuse. Right. And then you you follow my story through by the time I'm 16 and I'm living on the streets, I put myself in even worse situations. I, you know, I was raped by a 40 year old man at 16 years old. I was also raped by um, a man that was about in his twenties. Where were you homeless at? Was it in where you're living now or a different part? In Covina, West Covina, Baldwin Park yeah. and Mona. Yeah. And by the time that I did get back with my mom when I was 12 years old, I was just so rebellious by that point that yeah. I felt like I had to do it on my own. And so yeah. after all this work that my mom did to get me back, I left at the age of 16. Yeah. And I enrolled myself in, in the high school where I was located. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would bounce house to house from different friends and the nights that I did not have a place to stay, I would sleep in abandoned houses. I would sleep on the park bench across from. You didn't from want school. to go back to your mom's house, or I was I was so rebellious at that point. Yeah, angry, rebellious, and plus going through everything you went through, and this is I think important too for like children, teenagers, whatever, to get the help you need mentally to go through that. You can't just like, oh, you know, I'm going to go to school and I'll be fine. And I went through all yes. that. Like there needs to be some curriculum, something to get you through it. Well, and the challenge is that I had been through counseling throughout that entire period, but I had just there's a point where your your brain is not fully developed when you're a teenager and you're making very sporadic decisions and you're putting yourself in very dangerous situations. And so what do you do? You yeah. blame yourself. Right. So right. in those circumstances, I blamed myself. Is that what kind of brought on the addiction to like you were just wallowing in like this? Well, and the addiction um, at the time, it was a survival mechanism. Because, you know, using methamphetamines meant that I didn't have to sleep, mm -hmm. that I could be hyper aware if I'm in a, you know, if I'm at the park the night before, right? Yeah. And Especially I, if you're on the streets and you're homeless and you're a beautiful woman. I mean, any woman, anyone. But yeah, you have to be kind of on guard. All, all 100% of the time. And then at, on top of that, I had three jobs. And I was trying to finish high school. Wow. So I would take the bus to each job after I attended school in the morning. And so there's one morning in particular where I had to sleep on the park bench. I remember this distinctly because I woke up with like little dew on my face. Wow. And I waited until I heard the school gates open, kind of ran into the school gym to take a shower and get ready for school to act like I was just a normal teenager yeah. to school, then jumped on the bus 
and went to my my first and second job that I had that day. I mean, that's pretty commendable, Serena, that in spite of all you went through, that you had these jobs and that you knew that it was important to go to school and that, you know, you were like still doing what you needed to do, even though you were going through all of this. I mean, well, and it was also a part of me that was determined not to be a statistic, even though I was a statistic through the whole process. <laughs> <laughs> Well, how did your sister fare? I mean, did she find such strength and endurance like you did? Or did she go in a different direction? You know, I, I love my sister so much. I think the interesting thing is we both kind of healed in our own ways. Um, and healing is such a complex um, part of life because mm -hmm. it's an ongoing part. Yeah, yeah. And I I believe that she's gained so much strength and you know, so much wisdom from her experiences, but she also remembered more than I did oh, and wow. so, because she's five years older than I am. So she was 10 and I was five when some of the earlier things happened. Right. So she was a lot more withdrawn, whereas I was rebellious. Wow. And so I think that, you know, she obviously had her own experiences into, you know, her teenage and adult life. Mm -hmm. But I think that I I brought a lot on myself because I kept not re recognizing it, kept creating the same pattern and allowing those things back into, you know, my my safety zone. Yeah. Do you and guys so, have a relationship? Are you guys yeah. close? Oh, nice. So mom, your sister, you're all back as a unit, all healthy. It sounds like you went through yes. things and I'm sure it's still a process. It's always a process because you start to see you yourself repeating behaviors mm -hmm. that draw in unhealthy situations. Right. So for instance, being sexually abused or being raped, you start to believe that that's all you're good for. Yeah. Yeah. Then you start to use um, your mannerisms, your behavior, the way that you talk you feel like that's the only way to get what you need is by, you know, creating this persona that, you know, that's what, that's all you have to give. You, yes. you start losing your sense of self. Mm -hmm. And so what I, what I started to really recognize and learn is the self-love piece mm -hmm. that didn't start until, you know, I, I was sober I, you know, got my first job and I was graduated from high school, yeah. but then I had adult problems, right? So <laughs> it's like a pattern of abuse that I, that I lived through. And so my purpose is there's so many types of abuse that I've experienced. It's also self abuse. Mm -hmm. I struggled with eating disorders. I struggled with cutting when I was younger, right. um, you know, so you have to really look within. Yeah. Looking what, within. What was that first pivotal step? I mean, how did you, I mean, was it like, first, I'm going to stop being addicted and bad addictive behavior so that I can have a clear mind so that I can then go to the next step and be, I mean, how did you process all that to get started? How does somebody do that? So for me, I'm, I'm the kind of person that if I say I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it and I'll put it down and I'll never pick it up again. Wow. Um, but the addictive behavior will um, present itself in other ways, mm -hmm. what I learned. And so even though I stopped the addiction with drugs, mm -hmm. I then became addicted to my career and I was working, you know, 12 to 14 hours a day. Mm -hmm. So that addictive part of you also emulates into other aspects of your life because then you believe that that is what how you show worth right right, right? you're not worthy or valued unless you do this right so some of that through the years and through counseling and through you know self-discovery i've had to recognize that i can't earn approval i can't earn love that it has to be freely given. But my natural response is to earn it. Yeah. And to what, show that I'm good enough. Yeah. Let me do these things that maybe aren't great patterns to try to earn that. 
instead mm-hmm. of just let me love myself and maybe be myself, right? Yes. Yeah. For an were, approval. Were there particular like counseling things you went through or um did you read self-help books? I mean, it just the Yes, all of those things. Yeah. I was determined not to allow my situations to define my future. Right. And so okay. I was seeking any and everything to repair the damage. Right. So whether it's journaling, whether it was, and the counseling that I did was on multiple types of counseling, because when I was little, I was in counseling so much that I started to manipulate the counselor. Oh, <laughs> you know, you're like, I know what you're, where you're going. Yeah. I could, I could you're mirror the behavior. Yeah. Um, and so I had to start reading self-help books, start journaling, going to workshops as a young adult to really uncover some of the layers, you know, seeking out mentors and people that I needed to surround myself with that were healthy. Right. Uh, And and understanding that there can be healthy relationships with men Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there that it's not always sexual. Right. Even if it feels like it's always sexual, there are men that create a safe environment and you have to find the right people so that you can allow yourself to get out of that pattern. Yeah. I often, you know, think like so many times our bar is so low, you know, and you really have to raise that bar and really have these, you know, expectations of who should be worthy to be in your life. And if you can kind of set that up, what's the minute things are not, you're like, done, no, go. <laughs> well, it's hard because you first have to understand how to create a boundary and then how to hold it. <laughs> that is that is so key, how to create a boundary. Yes, so for a long time. A yeah, I didn't even know where to start with boundaries. I, And then when somebody breaks it, what do you do? Because it's not that easy if right. there's a dependency there for you to say, well, you broke the boundary and it's over. Yeah. So I created an acronym for my boundaries so that I would remember them. <laughs> and so, so yeah, because I couldn't. Well, n- number one, not only could I not remember them or hold true to them, I would justify and rationalize everything. Mm-hmm. Right. Because yeah. I'm protecting I'm nurturing. And so I had to really hold myself accountable. And so my acronym is BRAVE. And what it stands for is the B is definitely for boundaries. Uh The R is for reliability. And what that means is that you do what you say you're going to do. The A is for accountability, which means you own it. Mm -hmm. You own your part. Mm -hmm. I had a tendency to be overly accountable and I would take accountability for their abuse and my behavior. So you own your part is the A for accountability. The V is vulnerability, meaning you are prepared to have the hard conversations and say the hard things to say in a loving way. Mm -hmm. And then the E is for equal effort. If you're pouring your heart and soul into someone and they're not reciprocating, it's not equal effort. And so I had to remember those things. Yeah. Somebody is out of alignment with one of those, you know, values in my personal life, then I know that I have to create some sort of, you know, line. Yeah, that is so profound and such a good like protocol. Like, yeah, if one of those are a mess, then you can kind of dive a little like if they're not reciprocating or putting in the same effort, if it's not equal then you can look at that piece and say, okay, how are we, how are we going to maybe work on it together? Or is it going to continue to spiral down? And that is a breaking point. Well, and we have to communicate our boundaries or, or we can't expect them to follow them. No. And so that was a part of me creating my own boundaries and making it memorable so that when I communicate it, I communicate it in every relationship, friendships, you know, business relationships and, you know, personal relationships so that I live and breathe it. Yes. And there's an expectation. If I don't set the expectation and they break my secret boundary, yeah. then, then what am I going to do? I'm not going to say anything because I didn't set the expectation to begin with. And then that puts me back in that cycle. Yeah. So um, 
are, are you in a nice relationship now? Yes, it took, uh, it took a lot of years of healing. I was, um, another level of, um, my journey was I was married for 10 years. Um, and my husband was wonderful and charismatic and just this big personality, but he also struggled with his own, um, you know, mental health issues and, the abuse that came from that relationship was emotional abuse, which is a really hard one to define. Right. Um, and with that relationship and, and owning a business at the time, he was in the sales and he represented the company, my company. Oh, wow. And so what happened is that he went down a dark path and was unfaithful several times. And every time that he was unfaithful, he would threaten to hurt himself Mm. if I left, Oh, which is a whole different type of abuse. Yeah. So what you do is then you protect, you hide the truth because you're trying to protect him from hurting himself. So I, many of the times that I found found out about these other women, I would confront him, but I would tell no one. I was embarrassed. I was humiliated. I'm trying to run a business. Right. right? Like he's in the business. So my staff would know, my children would know, you and know. Did you think he would just eventually stop doing that? Or was there like, okay, now this is number three. That's it. We were going through counseling and workshops and marriage boot camps. And, and so I really believed that he was going to stop. Mm-hmm. And that's the the key perspective of an abuser, though is that the victim always believes that the abuser has potential to stop doing this, has a desire to stop doing this. And this is more of a mistake or, you know, it keeps happening because they're struggling. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so then we empathize and we protect and we hide our truth. And it was the third time in um, the 10 year relationship that I finally had the courage to like walk away Mm -hmm. and it took a lot because in my mind I could have lost my whole family would be torn apart right right? um the income he was the he was overseeing sales Mm -hmm. and so that was the income not only for us personally but that was the income for the business right and so it would potentially destroy the business and then on top of that I would be humiliated publicly because he would deny all of these things that had happened. Yeah. But the bigger thing was that if I left, would he hurt himself? Because every time that burden, right? Yeah. Every time he would threaten that he would hurt himself. Yeah. And I left him in October of 2019 and um, he committed suicide in March of 2020. He did. Oh, gosh. Yeah. But you know, like, that's not your burden. I had to know that. Yeah. But I had to recognize that before I could find the courage to walk away. Yeah. Well, so he had that mental issue all along, right? Uh, was it depression or? It was undiagnosed. Uh-huh. And so, you know, he'd have this charismatic personality that was so magnetic that people would just like surround him because that's how vibrant he was. Yeah. But it was when he struggled, you know, sexually with other women that he would revert into this darker place. Mm -hmm. And that darker place would cause him to afflict bodily harm on himself, which then would terrify me. And so my mindset would go from being hurt and betrayed into nurturing, protecting and, saving. Right. And so for, for 10 years, I, I was on this hamster wheel, just constantly running. Yeah. And the one thing that the, I, we were in counseling at the time. And the one thing that the counselor had said to me, and I had a private meeting with him is I said, you know, I don't understand why he keeps doing this. Like I'm an amazing wife. I'm an amazing mother. You know, I'm running this business with him and like I've given him everything that I could possibly give him. I'm, I'm amazing in bed. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm a good wife. 
<laughs> and and he said, the counselor said to me, he said, Serena, you can't earn his love, approval. You can't earn any of that. Yeah. You have to love yourself enough to protect yourself and stop trying to protect everyone else. Wow, that's so great too, isn't it? Because yeah, you were on that hamster wheel. Oh yeah. And until you get that revelation of like, wait a minute, that is that is him and what's going on with him. And you could do all kinds of things and it's still never going to be good enough. It never was enough. And then yeah. what, what really resonated with me is when he took his life, we had already moved into separate places. Mm -hmm. um, he was with, you know, multiple women, but the woman that he was with that night, um, she had reached out to me weeks prior and said, whenever we get in a fight, he says that he's going to hurt himself. Should I take him seriously? And I said, you should always take him seriously. Yeah. And that night they'd gotten in a fight. Both of them had, you know, a tumultuous relationship. Obviously we'd only been apart for a certain few months. So yeah. there was a lot of healing that needed to take place in general, let alone bringing another tumultuous relationship in. Right. And, you know, I think that that was part of it is that when you run away from healing, yeah. you start to dig yourself deeper right, to the darkness. Yeah. And when you hide your secrets, mm -hmm. you start to feel that in your body. Well, it'll just eat you up inside. But how do you get the courage not to hide and open your mouth and talk about it? And, you know, so many people can't do that. Well, they can. They can. Yes, they can. Uh -huh. Yes. It's the things that we're blinded by, like fear, mm -hmm. fear of abandonment, fear of not being enough, fear of being exposed right? All of these things are fears that have a tendency to blind us in our decision-making ability because it paralyzes us, which is why I kind of shared that I freeze, yeah. I freeze and I hide. And so what I had to do is recognize my patterns mm -hmm. and start working on myself. I could not change anyone else's behavior or how they treated me or the situations I'd been through. Yeah, All you have no control over that. Only nothing. how you're controlling the situations that are being thrust upon you, right? Yes. And to put perspective on my adult life is I was in my, you know, young mid 30s crying in the closet, which was identical to how I was when I was five years old. So I was just repeating patterns in every aspect of my life. And I had to stop and recognize it. So what I started to do is, is one of my, my methods was journaling, but not just journaling to write out how I feel. Right. It's more of purposeful journaling, writing. What are the emotions that I was experiencing during this situation? Mm -hmm. What are the things that led up to it? Mm -hmm. And what am I, are there certain triggers, Right. Right. What am I going to do differently? How do I, you know, how do I overcome this? And so and I would look at like these patterns you've been journaling and saying, oh, the same thing. Okay. So the same me... thing starts happening when you journal it. Yes. When you start is... writing it out, like this is what triggered the situation. Yeah. This is how he responded. This is how I responded. Right. You just even putting words that describe your response. It, whether you're angry, whether you're hurt, and then describing the outcome mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and writing that down in a way that the next time it happens, you can look back and see like some of these things are constant. Yeah. So it really helps you zero in on the things that you have to work on. And one of those things was I needed to stop hiding. Yeah. And yeah. how do you do that when you feel like you're going to lose your family? You're your gonna have yeah. your house, your marriage, yeah, you're going to have nothing. Yeah. So there's another piece of abuse. That's really a financial piece where is if there's a provider, right. And mm -hmm. you guys are counting on each other financially and they use that to say, well, there's no way that you can survive on your own without me. That paralyzes you again in fear because you're going to 
have yeah. nothing. And I don't want this to be that way. So did you just say, I'm going to take the risk because I need to do something differently and see where the chips fall or. I'm not that kind of person, right? I couldn't okay. just do it. I had to, I had to gain the courage. So I had to first identify what behaviors I needed to change. Right. Then I had to come up with a plan. Uh huh. Right. Because I needed to make sure that, that nothing happened to where I could lose the children Mm-hmm. Or, you know, because what I was more afraid of is repeating what happened to my mom. Right. 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 Like I was like, what? Foster care. Yeah. Because my husband at the time was making me seem crazy mm-hmm. because no one knew what was happening. Only him and I did. And so when I would act out in a way that was, you know, irritating to him, he'd be like, "You're that's a story that you're putting in your mind. You're just making that up. It never happened. Oh, and so then that's the narcissist behavior, right? It's another type of abuser. Yes. And so I had to really look at the only thing that I can change is myself. What are the things that I need in Mm -hmm. order to make that change? Mm -hmm. What am I doing that is keeping me in this situation? So that's one thing is identifying. And what were some of those things that you did do that you reflect on and you said, okay, I'm going to. I, the plan is good. I'm going to write a plan and make sure I safeguard the kids and maybe and get- and financially, how where am I going to go? Yeah, I where, to figure, where- yeah, I had to figure that out. Yeah, um, and at this point, our business was struggling. Uh-huh. Our sales were down. We were losing clients. Yeah, we had 15 employees that I had to pay. Wow. And I mean, you think about all of the dynamics. Yeah. You feel like you are trapped. Yeah. So I, the piece of identifying what my patterns were is I realized that I was allowing behavior Mm. and then I would justify the behavior and then I would blame it on myself. So I would shame my and guilt myself over behaviors that I didn't even do. And then I was trying to constantly earn approval. So I'm doing all of these things that are just literally fueling perpetuating the same, yeah, perpetuating the same situation. Yeah. yeah. And so the, I had to recognize all those things. And then I also had to identify who was safe that I can share this with. Yeah. That was my next thing is that like when you said, you know, you've got to, you've got to voice it to get strong. You've got to put it out there. You know, is it for someone to look for someone safe and trusting to tar- start to talk about this, have the dialogue and get sort get it off your chest, get it out, you know? Mm-hmm. The biggest thing about having other people that are safe is you have a sounding board. Mm-hmm. So you are no longer in your own mind mm-hmm. creating a, a story or whatever situation based on what's happening. Now you have someone that is a third party that's completely uninvolved that you can have perspective Mm -hmm. because when you're in it, you are blinded by it. Right. And even if you're confiding in those really close to it, that might not be so good because they might be partial to him because it's his sister or Parcel to you because it's your sister. And you then another fear comes in is judgment. Right. Right. Like they're they're going to look at me and think that I caused this or it's my fault or whatever it may be, or they're going to side with him instead of me. Mm-hmm. And not that you need sides, but you just need someone separate that's not closely involved that you can create some sort of safety with. Right. You could have a conversation and come up with some of those things that's going to be honest back with you Mm -hmm. and hold you accountable to actually follow through. Right. Yeah. That's they were going to do it. (laughs) Yeah. Cause how many times do you want to do it? And then you don't, and another year goes by and another year. Now, where are, do you go? I mean, you, you have so much wisdom on so many things because unfortunately you had to go through so many things. Are you on a, a speaking circuit to you? That's um, something that I'm now that I finished writing the book. Yeah. I'm on that journey. So I have, um, I've started speaking on podcasts. 
Um, I, I'm actually working on speaking in front of some nonprofits mm-hmm. that, you know, whether it's homelessness, <laughs> whether it's foster children, foster youth, abuse in any way. Cult. Yeah, like, so I, I realized that my story is quite versatile. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what I said, unfortunately, but yeah, yeah. you had so many levels and then you came out so strong and I think you distilled down that, you know, getting your inner voice and get, get going on that. Right. Yeah. Going so that's mind. my journey now. And yeah. it's, and remember, I'm still terrified because I find safety in hiding. Yeah. Even right. though I wrote the book about you can't heal when you hide. Go to, right. That's your go-to safety mechanism. Things yeah. Are scary. I'm, I'm going to go hide, but you, you check yourself, it sounds like, and you yes. look at that. Yeah. Now, uh, before we wrap up, I'm just curious, did your father go to jail, prison? Did he get in trouble for this? Yeah, he was. Um, they found that he uh, took my virginity before the age of five. And so that was part of the the evidence that was presented. And so he was incarcerated um, and that he actually passed away, um, you know, several years ago. Okay. I never was, saw him since then. Oh, he was in, he passed away while he was incarcerated. No, he actually was only incarcerated for seven years. Wow. Yeah. So light. And yeah. I would follow him on Megan's law just yeah. so I knew where he was so that I would never find myself in a dangerous situation near him. Yeah. Because I'm sure he had anger issues with you, you know, but, um, uh, well, I want to thank you for, you know, coming on and sharing your story. There's, it's so deep. I mean, we could spend another hour or so. I mean, there's so many levels to this. I hope that we find you on a speaking circuit because I think what you, your perspective is so helpful in getting persons in abuse to be strong. And I love the BRAVE acronym, you know, and setting those boundaries and just, that's like a great little checklist, right? For yeah, some- I had to remember it too. So I, I wish everyone book, right? could use it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I didn't put it in my book, but you didn't put it in your no, book. No, the book is literally my story. So it's okay, bringing okay. you into that trailer park. It's, it's, it's I think there's going to have to be a second book where here's my story. And then here's, here's the what I've done, how you do, do, you know, and live and be, um, and here's some tools. So, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, you're just an amazing, and you've got such a bright smile and such an aura about you too. (laughs) It's like amazing. So um, thank you. We appreciate you coming. Thank you for having me. All right. So with that, I'm going to kick it off. Welcome, Anushka. We're so happy to have you and thank you for taking the time. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Really look at and focus on, but when, because you're degreed, you just said, you know, you, you have a master's and you're degreed and you're very smart and intelligent and you're <laughs> successful with your channel. So you think like, how could you miss it? But you said, Matt, when it comes to matters of the heart, and I think when, <laughs> when we fall in love, right, it just like, your blinders come on and that's where we need to have a better perspective this is all to do with a lot of this is to do with our attachment styles and the way that you know we view and we see relationships but also the way that we view and see ourselves in that relationship so it's a lot to do with self-worth confidence what what we are willing to put up with what we're not and that's that's more about protection boundaries that sort of thing Mm -hmm.